It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Jason Jay today. So Jason is a senior lecturer and uh, director of the in uh, Sustainability Initiative at MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, he teaches courses on leadership, strategy, and innovation, and really with the aim of engage, uh, engaging students with uh, action learning projects with leading companies and uh, organizations. His research focuses on uh, how people balance uh, personal, business, and social goals, uh, with an emphasis on developing their leadership capabilities so they can have the tough, authentic conversations uh, about sustainability and other value-driven issues. Uh, so he is, he's here today to talk about the Institute's uh, progress on sustainability, uh, opportunities, and uh, how alumni can get involved. So please join me in welcoming Jason Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. So as you can see, I decided to wear all my regalia and name tags today because I'm an alum of the Sloan School. This is my reunion, so I'm a PhD 2010. I'm a senior lecturer on the faculty, and then I'm talking to you in part as director of the Sustainability Initiative. So I'm an alum on the faculty and in the administration. So if, so you know, I, if anyone is 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 uh, is is queued up to sort of talk about how to uh, how to sort of stumble among the various efforts on sustainability at MIT, you know, they 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 sort of picked me for this slot, and hopefully they also picked me for this slot as someone who can keep you awake on a Saturday morning after hopefully you've been out with some heavy drinking last night with your alumni buddies. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a bit about my own uh, background and my own encounter with these topics of sustainability um, and how we think about them here at, at the Sloan School um, with the sort of lens that comes from my own research and teaching in this area. Um, so I was uh, born and grew up in a town called Boulder, Colorado, um, where you'd expect somebody with sustainability in their title to be from. Um, hiking up in these mountains, um, and, uh, and when you hiked up uh, along this ridge here, you could look out over the city of Denver. Um, and Denver at the time was actually the second most polluted city in North America. Um, and uh, just from, you know, uh, coal and oil, oil refineries and traffic and so on. And um, when we, my dad and I would hike up here, you know, he would talk to me about these uh, these challenges. And he would say, look, there's technological innovation we can do, there's policies we can put in place, you know, we don't have to have these environmental challenges. Um, my mom was taking a very direct approach, laying down in the road in front of this nuclear weapons plant, sort of off to the side of the uh, off to the side here, in a classic sort of Boulder style of engagement. Um, so um, you know, so this sort of planted a seed. I was a little kid. Um, you know, I didn't think too much about environment or sustainability issues for a while um, until I was a little bit older and. Um, right after the dot-com bubble sort of burst, and I had found myself with some unexpected time on my hands. Some of you may, can, may be able to relate to that experience. Um, I went for some travels in northern India. Um, and, you know, Boulder Boy liked to hike, went up to the mountains in the Himalayas, found some incredible places to hike around, and literally stumbled on a dried riverbed full of trash one day. And, you know, when you find piles of trash in, and I spend a lot of time in India. My wife is Bengali, she's from Calcutta. We spend, we're, we, we, had, we go there about every other year. Um, when you find piles of trash in India, um, some of them are on fire. Um, it's one way to manage it. Not great for the environment and people's health. Um, some of it's being eaten by cows, um, although there's not a lot in here that's nutritious for cows right now. Um, some of it's being picked through by kids looking for something valuable for their families, right, um, in, in, in lower income uh, areas. And, um, and, and you, cut, you get to kind of sort of confront this, this, this experience of the wastes that we're generating. Um, you know, here in, in Western society, when, we're, when we have, you know, well-running trash uh, pickup, there's this idea of away, right? Like, I can throw things away. Um, when there's no away, things are a little bit more visible. Um, and we see that even just in the air that we breathe when we go to a place like Delhi or Beijing, when, you know, the air quality index gets above, um, you know, 200 and and it becomes quite hard to breathe. So I, I, I experienced a lot of these, these sort of sustainability issues firsthand, just traveling and kind of you know, being a concerned citizen. Um, and, and one of the things that I, under, that I came to understand was that you know, we can't just look at these as environmental issues, right? There's also some very deep social and development issues that are bound up 
with these issues. Um, there are people in the world who are trying to reach for a middle class lifestyle, find good jobs, increase agricultural productivity, um, you know, lift the, the billion people um, who don't have access to clean, safe drinking water or reliable nutrition um, out of poverty. And these are all really important endeavors for us as human beings. Um, and, and we need to understand that as being you know, part of this landscape of why we're driving this increase in consumption and, and so on that, that, that has an impact on the environment. Um, and sometimes when people are pursuing their livelihoods, you know, they're, they're pursuing their livelihoods in places like you know, the Rana Plaza factory in, in Bangladesh, which this, um, the factory collapse a couple years ago was the biggest industrial disaster of my lifetime. It killed more than 2,000 people. And, um, and you know, the interesting thing about this was that a lot of people working in this factory were actually climate refugees from the southern part of Bangladesh who could no longer farm because of increasing coastal flooding. So, um, so I had all of these notions about sustainability and these concerns about social and environmental issues um, sort of floating around. I was doing a lot of reading. Um, and I decided to come to MIT Sloan in 2010, because as a, as a, in 2005 as a PhD student, uh, which I finished in 2010, um, in part just so I could understand and wrap my mind around these issues a little bit better. Um, you know, MIT had, had this kind of place in my imagination. I had spent some time here as an undergrad in the media lab. Um, I understood it as a place that understands and creates the future. Um, you know, the first real articulation about sustainability issues um, had come out of the system dynamics group here at MIT. There were people thinking about on the social issues the, 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 um, and the workplace issues, people thinking about the future of work and what you know, technology might mean. There were people inventing crazy stuff like foldable electric city cars that could be used as mobility alternatives in China. This is a working prototype of a battery made out of viruses. Um, genetically engineered protein shells that have polarity that, and, uh, coming out of Angela Belcher's lab. So it seemed like if anybody could crack these big global issues, MIT could. Um, and within the Sloan School of Management, um, there, were, you know, there was a conversation that was getting started about sustainability. Um, and my second or third year here um, as a PhD student, um, a couple of senior faculty got together and they said, let's see if we can start making sustainability part of the conversation here. Um, and the way that they defined sustainability was as um, an effort to create a fundamental alignment between healthy businesses or organizations, healthy environments, healthy societies, and healthy economies that meet human needs. And this was you know, John Sturman and Rebecca Henderson and Rick Locke at the time kind of coming up with this sort of framing and saying, you know, let's see what we can if we can figure out what business can do to solve these challenges. And it was in a broader context of MIT, you know, starting to think in a big way about ener the energy challenge, for example, with the launch of the MIT Energy Initiative. So I was very excited, right? I was very excited to get into this whole territory of tackling these issues, tackling these issues from within um, business and management, um, which I thought was an, a really interesting leverage point. Um, and I got involved in all kinds of stuff. I got involved in helping to push for energy efficiency and campus sustainability efforts so that we could walk the talk here at the MIT campus. I got involved with creating a new course on leadership and sustainability with Peter Senge. Um, I got involved in nudging along this sustainability initiative. Um, and eventually that led to this, to this faculty role. And, and, and in that context, I work with a lot of companies who come to the table as action learning hosts. And so I meet a lot of people who are being advocates for sustainability in their organizations. And I was very sort of starry-eyed and very excited about this. And then I sort of ran into an interesting wall. And I found that all of us were sort of running into an interesting wall. And that is that when we come to the table concerned about these issues, um, thinking about sustainability, and we come into the existing context of business and the market and society and policy and politics as it is, okay, we run into um, the, 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 uh, certain collisions. And, um, and, and, and the way I've come to start thinking about this is that this, what I've just shared with you is my experience, my what I'll call sort of background conversation about sustainability. These are big issues. We've got to tackle them. You know, let's innovate. Let's go. Um, but 
That's not the only background conversation about sustainability. That's not the only thing that people are thinking about when we show up and we say, hey, you, you, know, you neighbor, you community, you company, you industry, um, you country, you know, let's get sustainable, right? What is the background conversation about sustainability? When I just say, hey, we're going to go on a quest for sustainability, or I'm, an, I'm the director of a sustainability initiative, what are some things that come to your mind as just sort of preconceptions or assumptions? You know, what, 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 what are some things that come to your mind? Free association, just shout them out when I say sustainability. What shade of green? What shade of green? OK. So what is that? Can you say more about that? Greenwash discourse. OK, got it. So there's a greenwashing, right? And, and, and so how much of this is sort of greenwashing? Yeah, go ahead. Eight billion people is not sustainable. Eight billion people is not sustainable. So there's, like, there's some fundamental population questions we've got to be raising. Yeah? Extra costs. Extra costs. This is going to cost more. How are we going to shoulder all these costs? Yep, others. Yeah? Equity across different populations. Equity across different populations. Great. Yep? Consuming less. Consuming less in conservation, but how do we make consuming less jive with sort of running a business and growing, right? Yeah, what else? Yeah? Political barriers in places like the United States where people think that sustainability is a left-wing conspiracy. Okay, sustainability is a left-wing conspiracy. Good. Transgenerational equity, yeah? What else? Go ahead. Okay, big promise of technology, right? And well, maybe there's some of these other issues are sort of going to be persistent beyond that. Yeah? Resisting the short-term pressures. OK, so resisting some short-term pressures, yeah? Is there a trade-off with performance? OK, trade-off with performance, OK? So, this, so, so this is, this is, these are the conversations we encounter. This is the pushback that we'll get, right? The, the resistance that we'll find around sustainability topics. And there's a lot of different dimensions to this. And, I, and, and I'm not going to be able to do service to the sort of the richness of, of this conversation. But there's a, a couple of themes here that sort of connect to what you, to, among the things you said. So someone said it's going to cost more, right? Someone said there's a trade off. Someone said we've got to consume less, right? But there's innovation, right? So there's the way that I've come to think about this is that the, one of the basic challenges we run into is that. There's, there's actually a collision of sort of values here. When we're talking about sustainability, what we're talking about is the future, the creation of a future of social justice and equity and flourishing of human and other life. Okay? So you can't have a conversation about the future without getting into some notion about values. Because what we value is what we create for the future. And there's, there's, there's something going on in this discourse of, about sustainability that is, um, that's about values being seen as being in trade-off with each other. And what I found was that there was a, a choir of people who are really passionate about sustainability and who are very comfortable and happy to be preaching to that choir. Okay? There are many, many, con so in a given year, I could fill my entire schedule every single week with sustainability conferences right, in industry, whether it's you know, sustainable brands or BSR or GreenBiz or Series or um, uh, you know, all, all the events that are sort of going on. And, and, and this, there's a community of people who are pushing for sustainability. And within organizations now, there are often sustainability departments who are sort of drive, trying to drive an agenda. And there are organizations, there are companies that have sort of made sustainability part of their core identity, like Patagonia and others, who are trying to sort of lead change within an industry. Um, but what we find is that there's this sort of division between people inside the choir and people outside the choir. And what the experience is, is that there's a tension or a trade-off between a, a set of values. And, um, and this, th there's, a, there's a basic kind of mental model here that if we're trying to pursue capitalism or businesses or products that are healthy, energy efficient, non-toxic, biodegradable, renewable, fair trade, responsibly made and organic, however you want to think about sort of sustainable, um, that those are going to be somehow in a trade-off or tension between these other things, which are about comfort, power, <laughs> speed, quality, low cost, performance, return on investment. How many of you have ever used a green cleaning product that didn't do such a great job getting grease off the pan or mildew off the tiles? OK? How many of you have ever driven an energy efficient car that felt kind of anemic when you hit the accelerator pedal? Okay. 
So all of us have had those kinds of experiences which, which sort of reinforce this notion that there must be some kind of a trade-off between these different dimensions. And what I've come to understand is that this mental model is actually kind of the, the big challenge, is how do we change the conversation about sustainability? Because what do conversations look like when we, in conversations between people sort of inside and outside the choir, what do conversations look like when we're operating inside this mental model of there being a trade-off or a tension between different dimensions of value? What does it look like? Us and them, right? It looks like my values versus your values. And very often, those conversations break down, right? At best, what we might be able to do is find some sort of compromise, OK? Show of hands, how many of people want to compromise on their values? Oh, OK. okay. Um, so, 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 so this, so this a, a, and what happens is that in the face of this tension, we as sustainability advocates can get kind of weird, right? Um, so you've got this kind of cartoon of, you know, we, I saw it, this came from a Google search for environmental wacko, um, which resulted in, you know, this kind of Al Gore looking figure, you know, repent, reuse, recycle, lest ye burn, right? Um, and at the broader scale, what we've come to understand is that this creates a kind of polarization, right? Um, sort of, you know, save the planet, kill yourself, which gets to that 8 billion people problem, right? And, you know, versus kind of Earth first, we'll mine the other planets later, right? And this is, a, and, and, we, and it creates this polarization in our political discourse and uh, in, in debates about climate change and climate policy. Um, and, and so the question is, this is, so I've come to think about this as someone who comes at this from sort of a leadership standpoint, that this is a very fundamental challenge. Um, and, and what we have to do is we have to sort of figure out what would a different conversation look like? Because the interesting thing about this polarization is that it's not actually authentic. It's not actually who we are and what we believe. Like, I would love to have, you know, a, you know, comfortable life with a nice, you know, warm, big home and, you know, all the amenities of modern life. Like, I would like, and, and you know, plenty of time to spend with my family, like, for me and my immediate relationships to flourish, of course I want those things. And I also want, you know, the planet to flourish. I want all life, you know, future generations and all life to flourish. You know, I want my organization, my community. We're all, you know, ultimately we would all want flourishing at all these levels, and yet we somehow experience there being this trade-off or tension between the two. Yet how could we say that all life is flourishing if my life isn't flourishing? Because certainly I'm part of all life. So there's something funny going on here with this trade-off mental model. So what I've come to think about is if we want to shift this discourse, if we want to change the conversation, the first thing we have to do is we have to sort of recognize that we all care about all of these things. Does that make sense? OK, let, let's get authentic about that. Let's get, let's get clear that we all care about all these things. We all probably have some degree of concern about performance. And we all probably have some deg care, degree of concern about impact. And so what we want to do is we want to complexify our mental model. We want to we not live inside this one-dimensional world that's creating this polarization. What we want to do is at least, at least put it into two dimensions, OK? Um, and think about this trade-off as existing, this experienced or perceived trade-off as existing within two dimensions where impact and performance could both potentially be important. And so that this notion of compromise is fine. It's a great, it's a fine thing to do. Like we should certainly be creating products and investment opportunities and everything else that allow people to move along this curve if their sort of, you know, utility function is along that curve. But I actually am not, I, I, what I want to argue is that this curve is actually an illusion, that this, this trade-off line is actually an illusion. And that it's quite possible and in fact easy in some circumstances to, to do what we really need to do, which is to push that frontier outwards um, and to drive towards innovation and flourishing. So when I talk about sustainability-oriented innovation, right, or innovation for sustainability, which is the title of this talk, what I'm really talking about is this. I'm not talking about moving along a trade-off curve. Because ultimately, this, I think this is an illusion, right? How can we have impact 
if our solutions don't scale to the size of the global problem. And the solutions won't scale if people don't want to buy them, and people aren't going to want to buy them if they're not high performance. So actually, this is an illusion, right? And the idea that you can have performance focused without thinking about the broader externalities is also an illusion, because you're not going to be able to sustain the performance of that system. So in fact, what we need to do is we need to break this mental model, we need to break open this conversation, and start really thinking about what does this integrative space look like? So, it's one th what I, so what I've come to understand is that it's one thing to say sustainability is about an alignment between healthy business and you know, healthy environment societies and economies. It's another thing to actually really engage people in a conversation about what is that space of alignment, when does it exist, when does it not exist, and how do we create it? Does that make sense? OK. So, what, so what are, so, so let's say that we're in an organization, right, or we're in you know, MIT Sloan, and, or we're in our politics, and we want to do this. How do we get there? Well, my perspective on this is that we have to take these two sets of values, however you want to describe them, we have to take both sets of values very seriously. We have to be equally rigorous about measuring on both fronts. We have, to be, we have to have voices at the table in the innovation process, in the management process, who are, you know, active, who are advocating on both fronts. Um, and when we do that, we start to understand, we start to clarify what is that territory. I have a question. When you put the performance and impact, there's the time dimension. Yes. And the mental model generally is performance I can do two, every two weeks or every month. Right. And that's the instant gratification impact. You're looking at the long term. That's a long term. Cares about it. I think that's a fantastic point. And I think this notion of a trade off between short term and long term notions of performance actually captures a, a huge amount of this, right? And so the question again is how do we do both, right? Um, well, one of the ways we do that is we have to actively look for and understand what are the value drivers. So in a business context, now there's a lot of other contexts for thinking about sustainability, but we're here at the management school. In a business context, what it means is looking for you know, real business value drivers, cost reduction, risk mitigation, revenue growth, right? Key drivers of the profitability of an enterprise, right? And we have to look for the ways that we can, we can do sustainability and create business value at the same time. So, you know, that looks like getting much more efficient with the use of, you know, resources. I work with the Environmental Defense Fund. They have this program called Climate Corps. They send, you know, about 100 uh, MBA students out into companies every summer looking for opportunities for energy efficiency. In seven years of the program, they've saved companies a billion dollars and a million metric tons of CO2 every year. Okay, so reduce costs by reducing energy use, reduce greenhouse gas emissions as a result. Make waste something that you are paying to discard into an input. Create a circular economy, right? Um, you know, Joaquin Bacardi, alum of Sloan, you know, runs a Bacardi rum factory, right? They figured out that they could use sugar bagasse as an energy source to run their process. They didn't have to buy more oil, which is really expensive in Puerto Rico. They didn't have to discard the sugar bagasse. You know, win-win. Risk mitigation, you know, thinking about operational risks. So Unilever, big multinational company, really started thinking about sustainability because they were in the fish business. They owned Gorton's, the biggest fish purchaser in the world for a while. Um, and they realized that they were, you know, tapping out these, um, these uh, fisheries to the point where it was going to be a business not worth being in. They divested of the company, right? So, um, and of course, there's legal and social and re reputational risks associated with, you know, being Gap in Walmart and having your, sh your clothing being manufactured in that Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh. Um, how do we manage that? Growth, you know, creating products that differentiate themselves on sustainability, developing solutions for others to kind of get more sustainable. You know, that looks like, you know, I mentioned that example of, um, Energy efficient car feels a little anemic when you hit the accelerator pedal, right? Tesla Model S broke that trade off, right? So now you have a car that is, uh, you know, a rocket and low CO2 per mile, you know, if you're on a decent electric grid. Some people say, okay, but you trade off against cost. How many of us can afford a Tesla Model S? Well, 
you know, next generation Model 3, they're targeting $35,000 as the price point. Innovation breaks trade-offs. So that's, you know, so, so, so this is when we see companies being able to do this, to hold this tension in a creative way, and to really actively search for these sort of win-win innovation opportunities, um, they, you know, th these are the kinds of value drivers they pursue, and there's starting to be some data um, coming out that suggests that this, this can lead to higher uh, financial performance. Um, so a colleague of ours, Bob Eccles from Harvard Business School, who's teaching with us this past spring uh, in S-Lab, with a couple of colleagues did this um, study where they looked at matched pairs of firms, um, you know, same industry, same size, past historic success, but one group of them had a really robust approach to sustainability and one and the other group didn't. And you look at the evolution of their performance over time and the high sustainability culture firms outperform the low sustainability culture firms. There's, there's problems with this kind of research. You know, there could be some underlying variable which causes both things. Um, you know, hard to tease that out. There's, there's subsequent studies that are continuing to sort of refine you know, what kinds of sustainability strategies, the ones that focus on the most material issues to your business and industry, are the ones that yield the greatest uh, profit and benefit. But the bottom line here, what I want to convey is that, um, is that there is this space of alignment, there is this space of innovation, but it depends on an organization's ability to really hold the tension between short-term and long-term performance, to use your um, uh, language, and, um, and, and performance and impact. And we've seen, and so we're seeing a lot of activity in this whole space around sustainability and people you know, across organizations getting involved. You know, the CFO of Walmart is a really strong advocate for these kinds of strategies now. Um, and my viewpoint on this is that because of the magnitude of the challenges, right, the 8 billion people, you know, trying to reach for a middle class lifestyle kind of challenge, you know, against a set of very strong and encroaching planetary limits, like, it's a much bigger challenge than the current wave of efforts is ever going to be able to uh, master or solve. So what we need is we need to really kind of push the envelope. And we need to think about how can we go push even further out on that curve in terms of innovation for sustainability, okay? Um, and, and, and what I've been up to um, with our sustainability initiative and my team here, Bethany Patton is here, and I'll, I'll introduce her more and say more later, and John Sturman and the, and the dozen or two faculty who are really actively engaged with us, is we're trying to figure out how to engage the whole institute in a conversation about innovation and sustainability. And there's great things happening that we can plug into, um, and I'm happy to answer questions about, about you know, kind of the wider institute efforts. Um, but the Sloan School perspective on this is that the innovation that's needed is partly technological, and that's really essential, right? You know, kind of thin film solar, you know, thin film low cost solar uh, Air, you know, generation and you know, precision agriculture and all the other things. But the innovation that's needed is not just about technology. And that's what we see when we look at the companies that we study, when we look at even just our alumni network, okay? What we see is that companies that, and people in, in the business world who are really pushing the envelope here are doing it through a few different domains. So they're certainly doing product innovation, right? And I use the Tesla example um, as one. Um, you know, sort of using, you know, creating more resource efficient, you know, potentially renewable energy recycled materials. But there's also really essential innovations in processes or management practices. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'll say, I'll give a, a couple of examples of that. Both of which are embedded in business model transformations, creating new business models that break these trade-offs. And, um, and those business models are embedded within larger changes and larger innovations in what I call market infrastructure or institutions. Um, and I'm gonna, what I, what, the, the cool thing about this is that this model um, came out of some of our you know, literature review and so on on sustainability and innovation, but it really came out of just talking to you. Okay, it came out of talking to our alumni and figuring out what our, you know, really our, you know, what our community was doing. So on product innovation, just as an example, you know, Alan is a um, Sloan alum from 87. I visited him out in California. He's got a company called Biosynthetic Technologies. They make a bio-derived motor oil, 
which is biodegradable. And it's higher performance than traditional motor oils. It leaves the engine cleaner compared to a petroleum motor oil. But the interesting thing is that it's biodegradable. So it turns out that there's about, you know, the Exxon Valdez spill, massive oil spill, right, off the Alaskan coast. Um, it turns out that there's um, about 50 or to 100 times as much oil as the Exxon Valdez spilling into the oceans every single year from distributed sources of, you know, oil leaking out of our cars, uh, service stations, and so on. If you could have a bio-derived motor oil, it would have a significant impact on that kind of challenge. So, uh, a, a, sorry, a, um, a, a biodegradable, that's what, that's what matters. So biodegradable motor oil that's higher performance. So that's an example of product innovation. You know, we're going to be seeing more and more of that. Um, process innovation um, you know, looks different in every sort of sector and industry. Um, Patrick Flynn was a student of mine. Um, he got really passionate while he was here on the topic of green data centers and the uh, energy use of IT. Um, and after a talk by Emery Lovins that we hosted here as part of um, the, the, the initiative, he, he came to understand that just working on the energy consumption of the data center was sort of missing the boat. That actually a lot of the cause of the energy use in the data center is how much you know, is sort of bloat in the software. And so what we need to be able to do is provide um, real-time power usage effectiveness data from the data center to the people who are actually writing code so that they can see the energy impacts of the changes that they make. Otherwise, it's invisible to them. So it's closing an information feedback loop in a sense. And he went to go work for IO Data Centers, which is a modular data center company, and, and, and is, and is you know, developing the essentially processes for their clients around closing that loop, right? And, allow, and, and working on the energy consumption of IT at you know, a system level. And what he said was that you know, the principles that, that guided him toward this kind of process innovation really came out of his education here at Sloan, really came out of what we do around sustainability uh, curriculum, which is that you think of it as a systems problem, you get rigorous about measurement, and you create communication and collaboration that are across traditional boundaries. So that's an example of process innovation. So product and process innovation are both embedded within business model innovation. And business model innovation has a few different forms, again, in different industries. Um, how many of you heard about, have heard about Sanergy? OK, a couple. So Sanergy is an is a, is a enterprise that came out of MIT Sloan. It won the 100K competition. Um, and the, what they're doing is that they're going into the mega cities in Africa um, where there's no really good sanitation infrastructure. Okay, The dominant mode of dealing with human waste is go in a bag, throw it out the window. It's called a sky toilet. Um, so instead, what they're doing is they have um, women entrepreneurs running pay-per-use toilets, and they have a mechanism for, for gathering the waste and bringing it to a, 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 a facility that converts it into electricity and fertilizer. They sell electricity to the grid. They generate profits that they can reinvest in their infrastructure. So this is a business model that, as it scales, deals with an economic empowerment question a public health and sanitation question, an energy generation question, and a fertilizer and agricultural productivity question, right? It's a systems approach. And, um, you know, like I said, it won the 100K competition. They're out, they're out in um, Kenya and Nairobi doing this work. Um, and so this is an example of business model innovation that tries to, you know, achieve, that as it grows, isn't trying to sort of mitigate its footprint. In fact, the more it grows, the sort of better its footprint becomes. Um, now, we don't know whether Sanergy is going to be successful, you know, it, or whether it will scale, you know, how it will work. Um, there are other examples of business model innovation in our network. Um, many of you might know Robin Chase. She started a company called Zipcar. Um, it sold to Avis for $491 million last year. And the interesting thing about Zipcar is that, you know, a well-shared car in these car sharing systems, it substitutes for about 15 to 20 cars. So it takes 15 or 20 cars off the road. Those are cars that didn't have to be manufactured. Um, and Zipcar users, because they're paying for the marginal cost of each hour driving, they actually drive less. They make more use of walking and public transportation than people who own cars. So this is, again, a business model that, as it scales, 
um, you know, mitigates the impact of mobility on, on the environment and on, and on traffic and on the associated headaches. And this is part of a whole family of business model innovations that we can broadly think of as you know, collaborative consumption or the sharing economy, um, however you want to think about that, which includes you know, Airbnb, which now has more rooms under management than any hotel chain, um, and you know, couch surfing, which is sort of similar, and a whole raft of different things that are arising now to share resources. Business model innovations, product, process, and business model innovations will thrive to the extent that we also enable or empower them through market infrastructures, through, through innovations in the way we organize commerce. So um, Mike Norman, alum from Sloan and Urban Studies, um, he, this, he actually pulled together a bipartisan coalition of Republican and Democratic Congress people to pass a, a law that's called the Jobs Bill, so Jumpstart Our Business Startups. And what it does is it enables crowdfunding of startups. So now, it used to be that you had to be a, 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 you know, a, a certified investor, venture capitalist, to invest in startups. Now anyone can do it through uh, this crowdfunding mechanism. And he created a company called WeFunder, which is one of the crowdfunding brokerages. So he created a new policy, he helped create a new policy, which created a new market infrastructure, which created a new business, which is itself a market infrastructure for innovation. And this is an example that I pulled off the WeFunder site of. A, um, a tool to help you manage your energy use. So this is going to foster innovation across a lot of different domains, capital that wouldn't otherwise have been, in, have been able to, to, to come into play. Um, another example of a market infrastructure innovation that you might be familiar with is the US Green Building Council LEED system. Um, the MIT Sloan School building, I apologize for the low resolution, is a, that we're sitting in right now is a LEED gold building. Um, and um, it uses 70% less energy than any comparable building on the MIT campus. The incremental capital cost of doing so was less than 1% of the building. Um, and, um, and, and certification systems like LEED orient people's attention towards those types of opportunities. It's not perfect, but it provides an important market signal. And there's all kinds of research coming out now that LEED certified, Energy Star certified buildings command a price premium in the real estate market. So these enable, these, these serve as enablers of new business models around integrated design, new products around uh, energy efficient buildings, and new uh, management practices around the operating of, of, of greener buildings. So what, what we've come to understand about ourselves as a sustainability initiative is that we, our job is to try to foster this type of innovation. And our best access for doing that is actually events like this. Um, we see ourselves as building a community of innovators for sustainability with MIT students and alumni, faculty and researchers, and allies across sectors. Okay? Um, and through that, what we hope to do, through this extended community, through your work and our work together, what we hope to do is drive and encourage this innovation in, at these multiple levels of products and services, management practices, business models, market infrastructures, so that we can together work to make effective, sustainable use of natural resources and advance human welfare. Um, and um, and there's, a, there's a number of different avenues through which we go after this uh, goal. Um, so one of them is student engagement. So we have um, a great curriculum around sustainability. Uh, last, this is data from our last year's annual report. 81% uh, of 2014 grads had taken at least one elective in sustainability um, from among the 64 that we've now been able to curate across the institute. Um, 273, which is about a third of them, had taken uh, three or more classes. Right? So that's actually you know, a pretty significant group of people going you know, pretty deep in the sustainability topic. 100 taking five or more, and last year we had 22 people graduate with our sustainability certificate that requires you to take seven classes in sustainability. Um, that number um, has continued to climb. The first year that we offered the sustainability certificate was 2010, and we had two people complete the certificate, one of whom is Carolina right here. Um, we've, we've grown that, uh, so last year it was 22. Um, this year we, had, we just graduated 24 a couple weeks ago. And the interesting thing about it is that 
Um, you know, 13 of them last year, 14 of them this year were MBA students, but the others were Sloan Fellows, um, System Design and Management, Urban Studies and Planning, uh, Leaders for Global Operations, pro master's programs from across MIT. And what that allows us to do is build a multidisciplinary cohort of people who can tackle these issues. Um, so that's one you know, raft of our work. And Bethany Patton, who's our associate director, um, what she does is steward students through that whole process, working with admissions, with prospective students, helping students navigate the curriculum and the speaker series and co-curricular events that are possible for them to attend, um, and then into building an alumni, a young alumni network. Um, what, as we do so, we get students engaged with companies. So our flagship class is called S-Lab, or Laboratory for Sustainable Business. We put together students with these leading companies to work on projects, six weeks, uh, or about a six weeks project in the spring, a six week project in the fall, a summer internship. There's a lot of ways that your companies can engage with our students, actually. Um, and, what, and, and, these, and when we engage with companies, we have this great network of faculty to help mentor them, which includes people all across you know, Sloan and MIT, you know, economics, operations, leadership, work and employment, innovation, and so on. Um, we're pushing on a couple of new frontiers in the curriculum. One is around sustainability-oriented innovation, mashing up this, our curriculum with the Entrepreneurship Center so that we can really push on this creation of new business models and new products and services in the marketplace and on financing the transition to sustainability and what that looks like from a finance standpoint. We have great strengths in finance. We have great strengths in sustainability. We haven't quite wired them up yet, um, but we're starting to make some really exciting inroads into that space. The second avenue for our ability to have impact on this is alumni innovation. Um, so we have alumni going into all different kinds of roles around sustainability. Some are going into sustainability-oriented companies uh, you know, clean tech firms, uh, in, you know, impact investment firms, NGOs, and they're bringing their traditional business skills. Some of them are going into the sustainability departments of companies or industry associations and driving change from within. Um, and many of them are going into traditional management roles in traditional companies, but they're bringing a sustainability lens and they're creating business value in ways that others hadn't anticipated. Um, so we've got a, a growing and exciting alumni network. These are just some examples of people that sort of fit into these different categories. Um, and increasingly what we want to do is bring those alumni together to amplify their impact, engage them with each other, engage them with the school, um, and, and, and increase the efficacy of what they're doing. Um, our hypothesis is that we can do this through a day of engagement at MIT um, with each other, faculty, and students around um, topics. So we've, we've, found, we've discovered that there's a, a group of alumni doing big work in renewable energy finance and project development, so that's one example. Um, Place-based sustainability innovation is a second example. People involved in real estate development or urban planning and the intersection between those two things. Again, the business of a holistic approach to place-based sustainability. Green IT is another topic. And we're always looking for, you know, where do you think there might be critical mass among a group of alumni to be able to advance your efforts together. So keep, you know, let, let us know about that. Um, and then the last piece is about changing the conversation. And this goes to the, the research that we do, the tools we develop, and the efforts that we make to gather the broader sustainability community together um, and, bring, and, and, and engage them around new tools for inquiry and impact that help, uh, that help advance sustainability efforts. And I can answer questions about what we're doing on that, on that front. Um, for you as alumni, um, what I just want to say is that there are a number of ways to engage um, with our work. Um, we have a, a, a pretty good presence on the web and social media. Um, we do a big flagship event every year, the MIT Sustainability Summit, that's student run that we advise. We have executive education offerings, so if you wanted to come for a three-day deep dive with John Sturman and Roberta Rigabon and Zainab Tan and Edgar Blanco and myself, that's a great program. Um, and we are always looking to engage our alumni in hosting um, action learning and innovation projects and internships. Um, every year we hit the road a lot. This past year we did events in, um, in New York and Washington, D.C., 
and uh, and um, London and in, in the coming year, these are some of the cities that we're considering. We know we're going to do Seattle because the uh, the Net Impact Conference will be there, um, and we're and we're figuring out our strategy for engaging these other these other markets. Um, we're also doing something for the first time next month, which is we're doing a joint alumni event with our peer schools. So um, we're not the only players in sustainability. Um, Cornell, Yale, Stanford, Duke, Michigan, and Sloan all have sort of distinctive offerings in sustainability. And so we're starting to bring together um, those alumni networks um, at an event in, uh, in San Francisco next month. Next yeah. July 9th. So that is, um, so that's the, that's the overview of, of, of how we think about sustainability, how we're looking to change the conversation around sustainability, what we're doing here within the Sloan School, what we're doing in our alumni network, how you can engage, and what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions and have 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 a bit of conversation with you to hear reactions and thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So, our targets for success. So these. Um, let me show you. So we think of our well. So our our our. our we think of these as their three core strategic objectives for the initiative, okay? So within student engagement, it's everyone coming through Sloan has some understanding of these topics, and a sub-community is able to go deep. And we have those metrics that I showed you about what that, what that looks like. Um, on alumni innovation, um, the things that we look at are uh, actually media mentions of our alumni doing great sustainability innovations is kind of a reasonable thing for us to look at because that suggests both that they're being successful and they're getting visibility in their success, which helps all of us, right? And so that's one of the things that we, we, try, to, we try to look at and report on and understand. Um, and, um, and then I think within the different alumni communities, within the different topical communities, there are going to be things that make sense to look at. So with renewable energy finance, you could imagine you know, how many you know, megawatts of installed capacity of renewable energy is coming out of the MIT Sloan alumni community, right? or the MIT alumni community. Um, but that's going to be up to those networks to decide. Um, and then on changing the conversation, which is really about our direct engagement with industry, um, there's, again, those are, those are project-specific metrics. Um, so for example, we're developing a platform for sustainability tools that sort of make sustainability easy, and there will be metrics in there around, um, around you know, the amount of content, and then ultimately how many people are using it, and then ultimately you know, how many people are reporting that it has a significant impact on their ability to, uh, to drive sustainability in their organizations. Does that get to your question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have First comment is that I was happy to see uh, that uh, and you addressed one very important point, and that is working in isolation a very great topic. It's yes. always a problem. Yes. But within MIT, within different groups of MIT, not only that, the Stanford and other Yale and other universities, you yeah. put together. Yes. That's my comment that uh, the problem can be solved together better. Yes. So I, I, I'm happy about that. Yes. And my question is, uh, you said uh, values and reality. They create tension. There is a difference in values and realities. In the beginning, you mm -hmm. talked about value. Uh, and you said that uh, we should uh, we should modify our values, kind of. Uh, but the real question, leadership question lies in how to make people understand uh, and uh, make new learnings. Uh, in, uh, because there is directive change in volume, and people raises change. Right. So how how to make people understand that? Yes. That's not good. So, so first of all, I'm just going to um, uh, correct one thing or, or, or sort of push back one thing. I'm not saying people should change their values. Okay. I don't think that's actually possible. I think, I think the, I think what we can do is we can confront the fact that we are all complicated. Okay. We all have multiple values. Okay. I care about my you know, the, the financial well-being of my family, right? And I care about the, the fiscal well-being of, you know, my city. And I care about the sustainability of the planet. Like, I care about all of those things. Now, I might, when I go to the voting box, right, or go to the grocery store, like, I might vote a little bit, you know, and I have forced to make a trade-off, I might, but 
really, I don't want to have to make that trade-off. If you can figure out a way to break that trade-off for me, I'm going to, I'm, then you're going to get three votes for me, right? So I think the first thing is that when we engage people, it's not about my, trying to change your values or trying to make you understand something that you don't understand. It's about, re, it's about sort of being authentic about the fact that we all care about a, 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 um, a set of future outcomes for society that we all want. We don't think it's possible to get them all because we think there are inescapable trade-offs. And what we say is, let's just pretend that those trade-offs aren't necessary. Let's just pretend that there might be a space of innovation that's possible, and let's hold that tension together. And if we do that, then we might be able to search for outcomes that we like. Okay, that's a different. That's not. That's not. That's a different thing from asking someone to change their values. Okay. Yeah. Wait. So wait. So there was. The, sorry. Oh, great. Thanks. You have the other mic. It looks. It looks that there is an important component of leadership on all of this. Yes. And so far, it looks like, the, generally speaking, there are a lot of individual initiative that the conviction is that is going to create a pool in the future so all the society can, can get into this. Okay. But that, that can take a lot of years. Yes. Is there any initiative that is ta tackling, I mean, young minds, uh, school uh, scholars, K-12, that... I mean, start building from down up, so yes. in the next ge generation will have the values yes. to, to tackle this? Yeah, I, I think it's a really great, I think it's a very sort of paradoxical thing about sustainability advocates that we say we want long-term solutions and we want them right now, right? Um, and, 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 we, and sometimes we, we write off sort of the future generations because we think, you know, that the, so I actually think it's, that education aspect is extremely important. Um, you know, within a management school, what access do we have to that is sort of an interesting question. There is a group called Sloan Ed, which is focused on education and educational technology, and the SOLVE conference that's happening next fall will have this learn component, which is all about trying to transform education. The one thing that we do, which is a lot of fun, is um, we've one of the tools we've developed around changing the conversation is a tool called Fishbanks. It's a multiplayer online game that gives you an experience of uh, fishing in a common pool resource, right? So if, you know, if, if, if everybody fishes too much, they'll collapse the fishery. We play that game in our classes here at Sloan. It's a fantastic learning experience. It teaches about systems thinking. Um, every summer, I do that for a big group of um, uh, middle school and high school math and science teachers who come to MIT to learn new approaches. And um, we, I, we do the simulation, we get it into their hands so that they can bring it out into the schools. Um, so our simulation tools, which is one of the things that um, we kind of curate and, and do as part of the initiative, I think actually have big implications for the, educational, for the education context. And it can bring kind of the unique MIT systems perspective into those contexts. Great. Yep. Uh, two, two comments, really. Uh, you mentioned Amory Lovins. And yeah. I, I, got the privilege to go visit his house. Mm -hmm. um, Amory Lovins is, I guess, probably one of the loudest voices in the room um, in sustainability. And he runs the Colorado, what, the Rocky Mountain Rocky Institute. Rocky Mountain Institute, yeah. I go to his house, and the thing is just a, a portrait of sustainability living. He said if he lost power he at negative 20 degrees, he'd lose like a quarter degree a day <laughs> in there. You know, it, it's a battle tank um, for sustainability. And I listened to him talk mostly about himself for about two hours. <laughs> he, grow, he grows bananas at, in Aspen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with no power from the grid. Right, like how does he yeah. do that? Yeah. Um, and at the end of the talk, it just something washed over me, and I said, you know, raised my hand, and I said, hey, Amory, are, are you an environmentalist? Do you consider yourself green? And he said, no. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, in terms of keeping things simple, you know, He's profit-minded, and I, I think it probably does well in terms of changing the conversation. As much as it rubbed me kind of the wrong way, and I, I started to just feel a little bit weird about it you know, yeah. through the course of it, because I just felt like his values weren't there, but his dollars were. Um, and I think that probably makes him a, a pretty strong proponent of sustainability in a sense in, in that case. So um, um, let me just show you something that's sort of fun. Um. And I'll show you why Emery said what he did. 
So this is a research study that was done by a group of scholars that did a broad survey of uh, US and Canadian audiences and they, using Amazon Mechanical Turk, and they asked people to just free associate. What are some characteristics of a typical environmentalist? Just, you know, free, you know, just free, 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 free text response. And then, they, and then they quantified the frequency of different words that came up. And these are the things that came up. So tree hugger, vegetarian, hippie, liberal. And I colored here in red, unhygienic, militant, overreactive, self-righteous, stupid, zealous, forceful, intolerant, annoying, crazy, and irrational. OK? Um, there's, my favorite one is Harry. Yeah, I like that one. Um, I was sure to shave before I gave this talk this morning. Um, but this is, this is part of the cultural context of this whole polarization phenomenon I talked about in the beginning, is that people, this is what people expect, right? from an environmentalist. And so you somehow, and whether or not that's how you're actually showing up, this is, the again, the background conversation about sustainability. So when Amory Lovin says, I'm not an environmentalist, what he's doing is, he, is he's playing with this, OK? Um, Amory Lovin's is, is, everything he does is based around his concern about sustainability. But what he's been able to do, and, what, and, and, and the reason why we have him to MIT about once a year, is that you know, he's really pushing on that innovation front. He's really pushing on how do we create a, um, a system that breaks these trade-offs, right? And his book, Reinventing Fire, is all about how to do that with mobility, buildings, um, city design, and, uh, and to design as a system that, uh, that you know, uh, finds those kinds of integrative outcomes. Jason, we have one last question yeah. in the middle of the room. In yeah. the middle right here with the microphone. Yeah, and then I'll come back to you at the end. Yeah. Um, some years ago, we invited uh, a Kayapo Indian chief to the U.S. for a the, meeting. Sorry? Kayapo Indian okay, from yes. Brazil. Yes. So we brought him to the U.S. for a meeting. Tell him to explain to us about his conservation. Yes. So he, his reservation area in Brazil. So he showed us a picture, a big square, I think about 500,000 hectare green. Okay. Look around it, it's all no denuded um, farmland. So we asked him, one of the guys next to me asked him, how do you maintain this area? Other, the, the, your neighboring forests are gone. You got this green. He, he said, anybody that come into my forest would kill them. <laughs> Sometimes uh, kidnapping also works. <laughs> so, uh, what, like, okay, after, if you look at the, uh, since uh, the Cuyahoga River burn and, and yes. the conservation green movement started until now, uh, all these conservation groups around the world. I think there's a lot of uh, talk and a lot of um, studies and, and, and education and advocacy. I, if I look at one of, I, I go around the world looking at some of these issues and I come to uh, conclude that one of the issues, one of the main issues is stakeholders versus equity holders. Mm -hmm. If you look at a lot of times, conservation people talk to stakeholders. Yes. Stakeholders are presidents of countries, ministers, G20, um, minister of, you know. Yes. Equity holders, uh, okay, you got land equity holders, yep. you got religious equity holders, you got, uh, you got cultural equity holders, and other types of equity holders. So the Kayapo Indians are one of these equity holders. Mm -hmm. They are cultural uh, and tribal equity holders. This is their land for the future generations. Yes. So they will fight for it. Yes. it I saw people in uh, Indonesia where the park, it's a national park, 200,000 hectare, designated national park. If you go there, uh, there's about five trees left around yeah. the entrance. Yeah. The whole, the, there's no equity holder. They are stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So these, this differentiation has to be, has to be uh, looked at. Right, right. Of actually creating ownership, creating property rights, creating a sense of, yeah. The, the, yeah. the, the rubbish yes. that you see, the and, trash. And part of it is also, is also changing the dynamic with uh, literally kind of the way we would think of stock equity holders, right? When, when, when Paul Pullman took over Unilever, he went to the shareholders and said, uh, he told the story at an event like this at MIT. Um, he said, you know, I don't work for you to the stockholders, right? Right after he was hired as CEO. He said, you know, if we are overly focused on short quarterly earnings, we're gonna undermine the future success of this business. The success of Unilever depends on our, um, our suppliers, our employees, our customers, and as a byproduct of that, you guys are gonna earn a return. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna abolish quarterly guidance. 
So Unilever no longer gives quarterly guidance to analysts about what to expect about their earnings so that the equity holders, the people who own the company, shift, right? They shift from short-term traders to long-term owners who are thinking about the long-term value and prosperity of the company. And I think that, I, that, that's just another example to, to add to what you're saying about land ownership, right, as another kind of important piece of this puzzle. Um, so um, I just wanted to give one last um, quick uh, question. We talked in advance um, to her. So, so can I just summarize it really quick? There's an, there, there's an alumni effort to, um, uh, that's connected to the effort to divest MIT's endowment around of fossil fuels, um, which is a big active debate here at MIT. Um, it's one that a lot of people have different opinions about. But if it's something that you want to be in conversation about, um, there's some information that, um, that Nina has brought um, about that topic. Thank you very much. Um, I, the other thing I have here is I have um, annual reports for the sustainability initiative in case you're curious to know what was, what was, what's been going on with our, our work in more detail. Um, but I really appreciate your coming out on a Saturday morning and spending the time and for the great engagement and conversation here. So thank you very much. Thank you.